Hi everyone, this is Gary Wilson and welcome to this week's live investor agent webinar. And again, for those of you who've been through any of the other training programs, welcome aboard. Uh, that would be flipping for profits without the risk, uh, rental problems without the pain, turning rental problems into real estate profits. Um, wholesaling is actively being edited and should be published again first quarter. Anybody that wants to be in, in on that on the ground floor, just let me know. Of course, is is active students um, you get access you get the the basic information for free the books and so forth um, and anything we have in the way of um, you know attachments addendums exhibits things like that you can get all that but the actual training program you do have to pay for unfortunately but it's but it is half price for existing students um, wholesaling has been a real hot topic lately uh, it's, it just keeps coming up so I figured I'll give it a couple of weeks to really go through a little more detail here so at least you have a high-level view of what's involved with wholesaling how to do it properly so if you're on tonight's webinar and you were not on last week's webinar you definitely want to get that recording and watch it and take notes because we gave a lot of good information last week so um, in any case uh, welcome aboard also to all the new folks if you if you just joined in the last month or so and you haven't been on one of these yet um, it is live it's totally unscripted unfiltered um, and the way we pick the subject is really you. You, you. you tell us what it is you want to talk about. And a lot of times I can judge it and kind of gauge it from all the, from the Q&A I get on a regular basis. You know, I have a daily one-on-ones with people, you know, what we call strategy sessions. And I also get emails. So based on that type of input, um, you know, it really dictates what we cover in these in these weekly webinars. So you have a lot of say-so in what we do. And of course, they're every week. And if you can't make them, uh, obviously we send the recording out the very next day so in any case um, uh, also if you have questions initially use your question box to post the questions and I believe I've been able to get through all the questions at every webinar generally we don't stop until you guys are the, all the questions are exhausted um, and sometimes we can unmute you but for some reason the unmute function uh, hasn't been working I've got a call on the go to webinar uh, by the way, I did get my new pick, my new laptop for all those of you who were um, patiently going through all of the uh, trying to figure things out. Um, I finally bit the bullet and got a really nice, um, basically solid state computer. It's uh, not doesn't have a, a physical or mechanical hard drive, so it's a lot more durable, reliable, and a pretty powerful computer. Um, I got a really good deal on that kind of an interesting story. I'll just tell you briefly. Uh, it was a Black Friday sale. I got a pre Black Friday the Friday before. Um, it was a Lenovo uh, nine, uh, Yoga 900. Paid for it in advance. Went up to pick it up this past Friday. They said, "Well, we got them in, but we sold them on." I said, "What about the one that I bought?" He said, "Well, we mistakenly sold it." And I said, "Well, what do we do now?" Because I travel. I'm not going to be here anymore past today. And uh, they said, "Well, the computer says we have one. We just don't know where it is." They found it. Turns out it was the next version up. Um, 500, it was the 16 meg RAM, uh, 500 uh, megahertz processor, um, and they gave me the original 500 off, and this one was $500 more. I got it the, and another 500 off of that, so I got a $1,600 computer for like 700 bucks or something all in, so pretty neat. Uh, pays to be nice and be patient because I the whole while I just smiled and said, well, let's let's try to find a solution. Let's see where you do have them around the country. Let's order it and I'll have it shipped to my hotel whatever a week up. Hotel will be up the following week and lo and behold, uh, the deal got even better. So in any case, let me check for questions here real quick, guys, before we get into um, more content. Let's see, Rhonda says, actually, I, it's actually called Inland... Empire Real Estate Investors Club. Okay, excellent. See, if you want to, if you want to you need to this month because RIA groups generally want to know well in advance uh, what's on their schedule. So, if you could, um, uh, you probably just had your last meeting actually last week or the week before. But if you could make contact with someone in the club and then do an introduction for me, I'll take it from there. Uh, but hopefully, we can get that arranged for you for that fourth Wednesday in February which I believe was the 22nd. Uh, is that right? Yes, 22nd. Um, and that would be wonderful. So appreciate you doing that. Okay, guys, back to the subject at hand here. Um, what we did last week is we talked about wholesaling. Um, really, 
as much as we could. We couldn't get through everything, but basically what I did last week is I went through this diagram here, okay, and explained exactly what wholesaling is, um, how you execute it from the investor perspective and from the agent perspective, and if you're both, what does that mean? And how do you accomplish it legally, ethically, uh, as a course, and of course, profitably, all right? So we went through that last week. Tonight, what I wanted to do is go over three things initially. I've got some other things we can cover if we have time related to the subject, but initially tonight I want to talk about what is a net listing. For some of you it will apply, for some of you it will not apply, because some states and provinces allow it, some states and provinces don't allow it. Um, okay. The, uh, the next thing is, is at LLC, we're going to talk about the basics of setting up an LLC, and I'll give you a little bit of an a insider's hint as far as who to call for that. She's actually one of her students and an attorney, and she owns two RIA groups. <laughs> and uh, she's agreed to have you guys uh, be able to call her. Uh, in fact, we interviewed her back several months ago. Teresa Martin is her name. Uh, she's on the community site. You'll have her contact information there. And if you want a uh, brief consultation, she will help you go through some Q&A and then help you get started. She can't practice in every single state, uh, but nothing like having an advocate uh, on your side like that to, to give you the questions to ask and the things to think about. Um, and, uh, and, again, she's one of us, which is even better. So, in any case, uh, the third thing is, is actually selling the contract. Once you get something, a place under contract, a property, under contract, how do you actually sell the contract? All right, what are the things you need to know about and think about uh, when you go about doing that? Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, first things first, let's jump to another uh, section here. Let me reduce my panel. So for a moment, I'm not going to be able to see your questions, uh, but it allows me to see the full screen, of course, you guys too. Uh, first things first. I've been instructed to inform you that I'm not an attorney. As many of you know, I'm not an attorney, and you know, I we'll always suggest no matter what you do, um, you, if you're doing something that you're not 100% knowledgeable about or comfortable with, um, or even you're not even sure, that's when you pick up the phone and call, you know, a competent attorney. And I suggest you call Teresa Martin because she's one of us. And even if even if you only get 10 minutes, man, it can really save you a. a world of trouble and, and money and she can help you matter of fact we have we have attorneys and real groups all over the country so if you're um, um, wanting to get with investors more in a personal way join your local RIA group and you'll have access to attorneys there every single RIA group has attorneys okay so in any case uh, first things first you definitely need to be aware of the rules and regulations in your particular state or province depending on where you are um, you know, what I'm going to do right now is talk about uh, uh, the subject of wholesaling relative to the sales end of the business, not necessarily the legal end of the business, although we are going to get into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm simply going to paint the picture for you and set you off so that you'll know what questions to ask and to know what steps to take to move forward. But first things first, um, in some states, you're allowed to do what's called a net listing. Okay, net listing is a is a variation of a wholesale uh, transaction. And again, again, for those of you just briefly, if you weren't on last week, you're not sure what wholesaling is. You're simply selling the contract. You're not selling the property. You're selling the contract uh, for the property. So in other words, you get the property under contract. Let's just switch back here briefly. Okay. Here's property A and party A. Party B is a, is a individual, could be an agent, could not be, could just be a simple investor, um, who gets the product property A under contract. So this person, for all of the purpose, like, she this property. But the reality is that she's not going to buy it. She's going to take this contract in her hand that says she's going to buy this property and assign the contract to this fellow over here. And he's going to pay her a fee for that, called an assignment fee, and he in turn will buy the property. Okay, so she's that's called wholesaling. She's wholesaling or assigning the right to purchase the property to another individual. And we went over all that last week. So if you want to get some details, uh, please look at last week's webinar. Now, that's that's basic wholesaling. Let's say in your state, you're allowed to do what's called a net listing. Okay, um, net listing is this. 
let's say this person B now, and I'm going to so scratch, this, wipe the slate clean. These people now play a different role here. Okay, this person um, is an agent, okay, and she wants to wholesale the property in a state where they allow a net listing. So, net listing. So, what happens here now? As the agent, she approaches the owner of property A. Okay, this person says, "Hey, I I just need to get a hundred thousand for this property. That's all. I just I need a hundred thousand, and I can walk away." All right, I've got some things I've got to take care of. I need $100,000. The agent, this person B here, okay? Now remember, put aside what we learned last week. This person B is playing a different role tonight. This person B now is an agent. Agent B, let's just say her name actually is B for Beatrice. She believes not only can she sell the property, but she believes she can sell it for a lot more than $100,000. She believes she can maybe sell it for $125,000. Okay, so what she says to the owner of property A is this. I know I can sell your property. I believe I can sell it for more than $100,000. I'm willing to take a chance here. What I'm willing to do is get the property under contract to list and sell for $100,000. However, I'm going to market the property for $125,000. Okay. So in the compensation section, she has an, a, a reference to an attachment or exhibit or addendum, whatever you want to call it, that she attaches to the listing agreement. And that, and that attachment, it specifies that her commission is going to be uh, the equivalent of any, any net profits over $100,000. So in other words, if she sells the property for $100,000, if she listed for one twenty-five, let's say she sells it for one fifteen. Fifteen thousand is going to be her commission. Okay, the owner gets his hundred thousand. That's what he wanted. She sold it for more than a hundred thousand. She gets anything over and above a hundred thousand. In this case, fifteen thousand. Now, let's say she only sells it for a hundred thousand and one dollar. In that case, her commission would be one dollar. So there is risk there, all right? Or let's say um, the property gets sold, but it sells for less than a hundred thousand dollars. She doesn't have to make up the difference, but the reality is. She makes no commission. So there is risk there. So the benefit to the seller is he's almost assured of getting what he wants. Um, if he doesn't get what he wants, he doesn't have to pay commission. That's, that's that's kind of a selling feature, if you will, or, or a pitch. All right? So in any case, the net listing allows this agent to essentially wholesale the property. She's really not wholesaling. She is going to sell the property. All right? She's not selling the contract. In this case, she's selling the property. Um, but her commission would be equal to an amount she may have may have obtained had she wholesaled the property. So you see what I'm saying, guys? Uh, a couple things to think about here. You might wonder why would somebody do that? Well, in the case of the owner A, they they might be in a situation where they need to sell. They need to sell ASAP, and quite frankly, they're frazzled, and their their desire, their need to sell, is greater than their need to get the most money they can. Okay, you follow that? Their need to sell, period, is greater than the need to sell for any for a for the most money they can get. Um, so it's kind of ironic, but believe it or not, it does happen. It happens uh, quite frankly, in fact, in certain states. Um, now, some of the benefits are this: when you're wholesaling, depending on how you structure things, if you're back to the original wholesale model we gave last week. That transaction, in a lot of cases, if you're not using an agent, falls outside the laws of many of the laws of real estate brokerage. In other words, there's no E and O insurance. So if you have a property sold, neither party has any recourse, any coverage at all in the way of a E and O insurance. Okay, um, that's why we like the, the the method that we teach which is what I went over last week, to encourage you to work with wholesalers from a licensee's point of view, because not only are you covered, because you're a licensee and you're covered with your E&O, you know, um, but so are the parties in a transaction, okay? You follow that? So a net listing, you're basically wholesaling within the completely within the framework of real estate brokerage, all right? So all the usual rules and laws apply. All the protections are there. It's basically a neutral system between buyer and seller. 
So that's a real big benefit of why someone would wholesale. Now let's say, let's go to the agent. Why would an agent want to do a wholesale? Well, maybe B's pretty good. Maybe she's been around the block a few times. She knows the values. She knows the market. She knows what's moving right now, what's hot, what's cold. Um, you know, she, she knows this property uh, in her mind should sell for more than this guy wants for it. She's willing to take her chances um, to increase her commission by putting her neck on the line, okay? By saying, my commission is equal to anything over and above $100,000. So in other words, she's willing to take that risk. Um, you know, if she, if she comes, if, she, if, if some days you get the bear, some days the bear gets you. She may get ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 commission, but she may also get nothing, okay? So there is certain risk there, but a person who does this, an agent who does this, is typically someone who uh, understands the business, understands the marketplace, understands the clientele, and what's happening right now in supply and demand. Okay. Um, now, it's what's odd is you might think, well, why would this guy do that? Why wouldn't he just say sell it for 125, and I'll pay by my six percent? Um, well, again, the pitch is, hey, I'll you know you. This is the agent. I'll sell it to you for hundred thousand. I'll sell it for you for hundred thousand dollars. If I don't, if it, gets, if, it, if it sells for less, you pay no commission. Okay. Uh, if it sells for one dollar over hundred thousand dollars, I only get one dollar. The bottom line is my commission is tied to anything over and above hundred thousand dollars. So there are people who do this. In fact, there's a lot of them. Um, in any case, the, this person here is, you know, glad to get a, a property. At a fair price, so she can sell this for 125, and the market determines that that property should sell for 125. This guy's not overpaying, okay? He's getting a property for fair market value. This guy's getting what he wants. He gets his hundred thousand. He walks away, lock, stock, and barrel, and B gets a, a bigger, fatter commission, okay? So I just wanted to go over net listing briefly with you. I'll go back to the um, the text here, and you have to check with your broker. And sometimes you have to, you know, here's what I would recommend, okay? Check with your broker. If you're really uncertain, call your state's local real estate board. Um, all of you are members of a local association, typically. Um, you can start by calling your association, your realtor's association, and they'll help you find the answer. In other words, does your state allow you to do net listings? And uh, you can also go to your state's um, Association of Realtors or the State Board of Realtors. There's a number of places you can go to, and it's not a very uncommon question. Oftentimes, they'll know right off the top of their heads, but more importantly, they can direct you to the right literature, uh, the right locations online to do your research. Okay, um, I've done net listings. They, they absolutely do work. I like them because there's there's more protection there within the within the uh, framework of real estate brokerage. I like that. Okay. Um, if your state doesn't allow it, then you're back to what we talked about last week. I just want to let you guys know that in some states and provinces, uh, you've, you've got a you've got another opportunity here, a way out, you know, to to do that. So, in any case, uh, I just described here in this content, and this is in the book, you know, wholesaling so everybody wins. Um, I'm not sure if Beverly sent that up, but you all have access to it online, regardless if you're a brand new um, student. You probably are going to be getting loaded to the membership section this week. You already have access to the training material, but this is another section of the website uh, that gives you access to all the uh, previously recorded webinars, all the interviews we've done. Um, it, uh, you know, it's all out there. The the written material, the books, I think, are in a different section of the website. You don't have to wait for that. You can go any time. But the example in this book just gives you the example property. Uh, it was sold for thousand dollars, and the agent sold it for one twenty, and, and therefore their commission was twenty thousand dollars. That's the example there. Okay. Um, in any case, the next thing I want to touch on, guys, is LLC. It's just setting up a basic, simple LLC. In Canada, we call it something different, uh, but it's essentially about the same. There's uh, Canadian contract law is actually simpler than U.S. contract law. There's not as many variables, not as many variations. So it's more expensive. In Canada, I think to set up a basic um, corporation partnership kind of thing, uh, this, the, the 
government charges you $800, okay? In the states, you can often get a LLC set up for about 125 bucks. Matter of fact, we'll look at an example here in a little bit. So before we go forward, let me check for questions. Um, based on what I just showed you guys for net listings, please let me know if there's anything you're unclear about, any fogginess, uh, because now's the time to ask. Um, okay, let me see. I'm almost through here. I think we're, I think we're okay on questions. Let me go back the other direction just to make sure. Um, okay, I think we're all set. Okay, LLCs. All right, LLC, I'm going to reduce my panel again so I can't, won't be able to see your questions here for a few moments, right? LLC is an acronym that stands for Limited Liability Corporation or Limited Liability Company, okay? Um, the, the, the basic types of entities when it comes to setting up business structures are C corporations. A C corporation is what you might find typically with something like Coca-Cola, General Electric, um, Westinghouse, uh, you know, big, big corporations are almost always C corps, okay? Another type of a corporation is an S corp, okay? Um, S corp is typically much smaller in size than the, in other words, the underlying business that's uh, operating under an S corp guidelines is typically much smaller than a C corp. A lot of times these companies are owned um, mainly by individuals although they can shell, sell shares of the S corporation, um, where C corps are typically not family owned. They're typically uh, owned by shareholders. Now, it doesn't mean all of them, and there's certainly a lot of C corps out there. They're what we call closely held corporations. Um, even though they have shares, uh, you, can, you can look at the annual report and see who really owns the business. <laughs> okay, C corps are generally your, um, I'm sorry, S corps are usually the ones you might find around town a lot of times um, they're you know, small manufacturers, um, mom and pop type organizations. Uh, a lot of, I've seen a lot of restaurants use S Corps. Uh, print shops will, can, will usually be set up as uh, S Corps. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of examples of S Corps. I've even seen uh, property management companies set up as S Corps. I've even seen people who are real estate investors owning real estate inside S Corps. I had one guy argue with me uh, incessantly about it over, over a period of months and years. And he was the only guy, this was a local, um, it was a real estate association that I belong to uh, for, for, for property managers, right? Um, and this guy was an owner and he became a, a member of the board of the property management association in the area. Um, even though he didn't manage for other people, he just managed his own, but he was so he had thousands of units. Okay, the guy was a big operator. He insisted that S Corp was the way to go when you own real estate. And yet every accountant, every attorney, everybody was saying, no, if you're if you're owning real estate for rental purposes particularly, you should be owning them inside an LLC. And that's what I've always done. I've used LLCs. The benefit of an LLC is um, it gives you the liability protection of a corporation. Okay, in other words, it, it separates you by one layer from direct ownership of an LLC. Okay. Um, the other thing too is it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you file your taxes and when and when you file what your fiscal year is. But essentially, an LLC can be, you can elect, there are certain elections you make, and those elections are such that you can make it look like a C-Corp, you can make it look like a like a partnership, you can make it look like a sole proprietorship, which is you owning it, and you're the only one that owns everything, all right? Um, LLC look to the government and the IRS, um, and, and it, you do have the ability to make change uh, at certain time frames. It's just a great, great entity. Um, started back a generation ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago. And in the 90s was really was going through was, uh, what we call the testing period as far as case law goes. Uh, but now there's a solid body of case law going over a good solid generation, you know, say five years. Um, so LLCs are also very easy to set up and very inexpensive 
um, to set up and very inexpensive to maintain and report on going forward. So as you might imagine, I'm a big fan of LLCs, if I hadn't made that clear. <laughs> now having said that, um, early on in my investing business, at one point I had as many as 20 properties in my own name. They were not even an LLC. I don't recommend doing that, um, although there may be times when you know you're it just, it just you do it and um, everything's okay. I never had a problem with them, actually. Um, and by the way, a quick misnomer here. Um, an LLC, Dan Levy's one of our, just popped up on my screen here, he's one of our students. Um, LLC uh, is not meant to be used uh, for the purpose of keeping you out of trouble, okay? If you're looking at an LLC to keep you out of trouble, um, you've probably got the wrong frame of mind. So here's the way I'll describe this to you. This is what had, this is what a liability, how liability should be viewed, okay? If you own your own properties, and this is, you should be taking notes here because this is what you want to tell your investors, okay? Um, when you own properties, rental properties, your first line of defense is you being a good owner, maintaining the property in a safe, clean, reliable condition that's, that's up to code, um, and it's, everything operates and functions correctly and safely, all right? Um, so that, first line of defense is you being a good owner, you or your client, all right? If you're, if you're, if you're not an owner yourself, but your clients are. Second line of defense is you still have property insurance on all your properties. Um, in fact, if you have loans on your properties, you you have to have you know property insurance. You won't get a loan from anybody without property insurance on your property. So let's say this somebody does a proverbial slipping on a bar of soap and falls down and wrenches their back, okay? Um, and they decide to sue. The first thing they're going to do is uh, your insurance is going to get involved. Matter of, matter of fact, you, if you don't know this already, whenever you find somebody making a claim against you, whether you believe it's right or wrong, always call your insurance company first. Homeowners, auto insurance, typically they're the same company. And they'll tell you if, they, if you have any, something might be cover, covered under your homeowner's insurance, for example, okay? Um, so in any case, second line of defense is your property insurance. And in most cases, like 99.9% .9 of the time, they will satisfy the claim. I've had a couple of claims over the years um, never had a problem. First one was somebody actually slipped outside the house, grabbed a handrail we just literally just put in, pulled it out of the wall, and sprained her ankle. And she filed a claim with the hospital, you know, from her hospital bills. And my insurance company covered it. And uh, all I had to do was sign one paper and say yes sir over the phone. That was it. Okay. Another one I had was a large uh, house fire. It was a big, big deal. Um, but it was not a big deal for me because I had insurance. And they did the investigation, they found out I was not liable, it was the tenant that was the one that screwed up. Um, I've had other situations too, but, but again, I never had a problem. I never had anybody get past the insurance because I was always a good owner, okay? Now that's the second line of defense. Third line of defense is, you got it, your LLC. So let's say, um, Let's say a, a child dies in one of your units, or your, um, your elderly person passes away in one of the units, okay? And the family decides to sue, and they're going to sue for millions of dollars, and your insurance only goes up to a million. Well, the next thing they'll do is going to go to the ownership of the property, in this case, the LLC. Well, the LLC is only going to have uh, the properties in the LLC owned by the LLC. In other words, your LLC is not going to own your personal home. Your LLC is not going to own your personal car or any of that kind of stuff, right? So if they do get through to the LLC, um, you might find your your property that's held in the LLC and other, any other properties held in the LLC by the LLC to be subject to claim. Okay, that's, that's, that's why I never had more than a million dollars in any one LLC. Once I got to a million dollars in an LLC, I just set up another one. Um, uh, and I never had anybody get to the LLC, uh, but some of you are probably wondering now, hey Gary, we've heard the term piercing the corporate veil. What that means is they get to the LLC level in a lawsuit and they try to go beyond or go through that protective veil the LLC of 
affords you. In other words, the liability protection the LLC gives you, they try to penetrate that and get to you personally. Because let's say maybe you're a millionaire and you own other properties and vacation homes and boats and things like that. Um, they could attach those in a lawsuit if they pierce the corporate veil. But when you have an LLC, as long as you do things correctly and you should you should study um, matter of fact there's a um, there's a book called Inc and Grow Rich INC <laughs> Inc and Grow Rich like the like the book Think and Grow Rich which you should all read Inc and Grow Rich describes all this to you um, but essentially you're going to have separate operating account you know checking account um, everything is going to be signed in the name of the LLC so you never would sign um, you know, Gary Wilson, you would sign Gary Wilson, comma, member LLC on everything, every check, every contract, everything. And when you do that that way, and you don't commingle funds, all the money going through that account that's owned by the LLC is solely for the purpose of the properties, um, then it's going to be very difficult for someone that appears to corporate veil. Okay? I mean, there's other things you can do too that are way beyond the scope of tonight's discussion, like set up trusts and blanket uh, blanket cor holding corporations that actually own all the LLCs. I don't, I've never had to go all that way with that kind of, I do have a trust, but it's used for different purposes. Um, in any case, back to the LLC. If you have never set up an LLC before, um, you should hire an attorney to do it the first time, all right? Now, once you've done it the first time and you set up other LLCs that are exact clones of the, the, the first one, Yes, you can do it yourself. I, you know, again, I'm not trying to give you, tell you what you should do. I'm just telling you what's possible. Okay, in every state and province I've looked in, you don't have to have an attorney set up an LLC. Um, excuse me. In 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 Canada, uh, you do need to have a legal representation, and it's not called an LLC, by the way. But in any case, in most cases, you can do it yourself. I think you should use an attorney the first time. All right. Now you're going to get a corporation, you're going to get an LLC, you're going to get a separate tax ID. Okay. Again, to the government, this LLC is actually like another person. It's another entity just like you are. All right. It's taxed separately. By the way, the uh, uh, good thing about an LLC is the income and expenses in that are what we could call pass through. So those income and expenses pass through the LLC to you on your tax returns. So your tax returns are actually quite simple compared to C corps and every other kind of corporation, right? Um, so in any case, uh, the, you'll have to file typically in any state um, separate state filings for the LLCs, but for the federal government, if the LLC simply owns properties, you would identify your properties in Schedule E and in parentheses, your tax account would generally refer to the LLC that owns the property. But the Schedule E goes on to your personal tax return, right? Um, so in the case of wholesaling, let's go back to wholesaling now. Okay, we talked about LLCs. Um, by the way, for those of you who are curious, you can go ahead and split your screen right now and Google whatever state you're in, California, Florida, what have you, you know, Georgia, you know, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, all these places I've been recently. Google State Bureau of Incorporation or State Incorporation Bureau. So they're all could be named differently. But basically, you're looking for uh, the state website that represents the entity, typically some type of Secretary of State um, that deals with people setting up companies. And in Pennsylvania, uh, you go to Pennsylvania uh, Open for PA, Open for Business. All right, and on there you can get what's called a PA100, and you fill out the PA100, and that's essentially you setting up an LLC, and then you will call the IRS and get your actual individual tax ID. That doesn't cost anything, by the way. So to file a PA100 costs $125. To get a tax ID from the federal government costs nothing. So for five bucks, you essentially can be in business. Now you have to have other things like operating agreements and. Uh, you got to have annual meeting minutes, things like that. Um, uh, you can even pay companies to do that for you. All that you have to have all that done so that your corporate veil can't be pierced in a lawsuit, right? If you don't do annual meetings and have annual meeting minutes, <laughs> that's one of the things good attorneys look for. And it gets back to this. Um, let's say you got your LLC, all right? What I want to do is uh, 
let's go, let me flip back to my chart here. This is going to make things a little bit easier. So in this case, back to the original blueprint for wholesaling, party A owns the property, property A, party B is a wholesaler, we're going back to the original model, party B is a wholesaler, party C is the, the consumer who's going to buy the contract from party B, okay, in this case. Now, what's happening here is this person is now going to be an LLC, so instead of Beatrice or B getting property A on a contract, Beatrice is going to use her LLC to do that. So it's Beatrice comma LLC is going to get the property under contract from party A. Now let me do a real quick pause here and check for questions. Um, I apologize, I should have done that before I started this next segment. I want to see if anybody has any questions at all, any help on LLCs. Um, um, we, can, we can Google right now, live online, we can Google any states and corporation bureau to help you all get started. So if anybody wants to do that, please let me know. We can do that live online um, to help you get started. I'm going to sh it'll show you really how easy and simple this process is. So go ahead and do that. I will give you a second to type in questions while I'm waiting here. Okay, let's see. Okay, some of you are saying you actually have LLCs. Well, that's excellent. I'm, glad, I'm, I'm proud of you and glad that you're doing that. Um, okay, it's funny because the ones who are already have LLCs are the ones who are chiming in. <laughs> and uh, if you don't have an LLC and you're not sure about it, uh, you can always call me, email me, text me. Um, if you're not, if you need help getting started, we'll help you get started. Just remember, Teresa Martin is one of our team members. Um, and she did say, if you read, if you listen to her interview, um, it's out there on the member section. Uh, she gives you her contact information, and it's also on the on the um, our community site. So once you've been in for the, at the end of every month, we load up all students we've added in the prior month onto the community site. So, in any case, in this case, the B is going to be the LLC. Okay, so it's not going to be Beatrice getting this on her contract. Beatrice comma LLC is getting the contract. And then Beatrice LLC, all right, sells the contract to this gentleman, he, part of party C for Charles, okay? So in other words, what's happening is, is B has separated herself from the transaction by one layer. The LLC is the workhorse here and not Beatrice. So if there's a lawsuit, the LLC will be the one named in the lawsuit, okay? And if, even if they do name B, Name Beatrice in a lawsuit, her attorney is going to be good enough that he can have that that uh, that thrown out. In other words, he's going to uh, remove her from the case because the LLC is legitimate. All the paperwork was filed correctly. They do annual meetings. Uh, they haven't commingled funds. Um, all those things have been done properly. So, all right, let's go back here to where I was. All right. Uh, I just want to make sure you're aware of one more thing when it comes to wholesaling. If you're wholesaling in your own name, or your clients are, so please remember to write this down, guys, so you can tell your clients. In every state we've been in, if you, as soon as you wholesale more than five contracts in any calendar year, that state could deem you to be a dealer. They call it giving you dealer status. Okay, and when you have dealer status. What that means is you have to file as a corporation your taxes. You've got to file a C corp, or basically Schedule C. Excuse me. Um, if you don't, so if you don't set yourself up initially, proactively in advance, or you dictate and control and determine what your entity is going to look like, if you don't do that, and the authorities determine you've you've sold five contracts this year, and you haven't done that, they could, by default, they're going to look at you as a C corp, which is Typically, that's how the tax version of corporations. There's a lot more to that. I know there's, all, there's books on that subject. The book I gave you, Inc. and Grow Rich, covers all that. Um, now, they're big proponents of C-Corps, but I will tell you, um, you've got to really know what the heck you're doing because if you don't take advantage of all the tax laws, you're going to find yourself paying way too much in taxes by using a C-Corp. Most people fall in that trap. They think they're going to do everything they can to maximize the benefits of a C-Corp. And what happens is 
they, they don't maximize the benefits. They still pay the taxes on the income of the corporation and the income to the owners of the corporation because their, their dividends get taxed as personal income after they've already been taxed as corporate income. <laughs> So if you're not taking advantage of all these other benefits in a corporation, all you're doing is paying all these extra taxes. You're just throwing your money down the toilet. Just remember that five deals, you, you could be determined to be a dealer. In fact, I wouldn't even take the risk. Um, you might get away with it. You might not, but why take the risk? I mean, for, for a mere few hundred dollars, it is well worth it to set up this LLC. Okay. Um, also remember, whenever you use an LLC, uh, you always sign it with your name, okay, and this, a comma, the word member, and you can put in the name of your LLC. So in this case, Beatrice Jones, comma, member, Beatrice LLC, all right? Um, you, couldn't, you can't just say member LLC, assuming that the LLC is mentioned somewhere on that page of a contract. That's okay here. All right, here's the example, John Smith, member ABC LLC. Um, do that on every single thing you sign relative to that corporation, to that LLC, excuse me. Every check, every contract, every single thing you do. Um, matter of fact, I would even do it for um, every piece of correspondence. Um, you know, you don't want to uh, send communications out, rent communications, and sign it in your personal name. You always sign it in your name, comma, LLC the name of your LLC and, your, and the, the word LLC, okay? All right, now, uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of tax benefits tonight because it, that's a different subject. Um, just know that the LLC um, is it's it basically a pass-through entity, so income expenses on those forms pass through to you personally on your tax return. Um, you still get the benefits of being in a corporation, but... Uh, you don't have to pay corporate type taxes, you pay personal taxes, right? It does give you the liability though of the corporation. So just remember that that basic concept here. Um, so I'll give you an example of why that's so important since we're on the subject. In the case of rental income, see rental income is called, according to the IRS, passive income. What that means is it's income that comes in whether or not you do anything or not. Um, you know, technically the way they wrote up the tax code, it looks like you should be completely hands off. You're not doing anything. That money just rolls in on its own. So we know that's not true, but they still call it passive income. So what that means is passive income, you don't pay Social Security tax on that. Passive income, you only pay income tax. You follow what I'm saying? So rental income, passive income, is the least taxed form of income at a personal level. Remember that passive income, you only pay income tax not Social Security tax. So in the case of an LLC, that passive income is passing through to you, through the LLC, through to you on your personal tax return. So you get the benefits of having passive income, and you get the benefits of, of liability protection by having that property owned in an LLC. Now that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. <laughs> so just remember that, again, it's all in the, in the information. You can get it for free on the website, okay? Uh, other thing, of course, and I'll just touch on this as we're going through it. Obviously, you can determine when your fiscal year is, so you can determine when you pay taxes, okay? Um, in any case, let's, uh, let's move on here. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because we've covered that in another section. Uh, let's go to, uh, let's see here, page 129, okay? Uh, let's talk about selling the contract. Hopefully we can get through this, at least this portion, um, which is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Again, if I have a few minutes, I might touch on one or two more things. Before we get into selling the contract, let me bring my panel back over and look for questions. And, well, you guys are quiet tonight. Maybe everybody's still from Thanksgiving. By the way, I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving. Um, actually, Thanksgiving is one back in October because I... Of course, I'm a um, quasi quasi Canadian, so I had a Canadian Thanksgiving October. <laughs> um, I had uh, American Thanksgiving on Thursday, around one o'clock in the afternoon with my dad in Washington D.C., and about six o'clock at night, actually more like eight o'clock at night, with my mom in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I had three Thanksgivings. 
And if I turn to the side and look at my profile shot, you can say, yep, looks like you had three Thanksgiving dinner here. But anyway, so hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. I don't see any questions here. I'm going to pull my panel back and get into selling the contract. Um, very, very important here, guys. Um, let's say you get your, okay, let's go back here. Let's say you're now B, you're Beatrice, right? Whether you're an individual doing this on your own, you're an agent, you're in an LLC, you're not an LLC, regardless. You've got this place under contract. Now, you've got to sell this contract in your hand here to this gentleman here, Mr. C, Mr. Charlie, all right? Now, you've got to do it in such a way that he's going to actually like what he sees. He's going to want to buy the property that's represented in the contract. In other words, remember, you're selling the contract. In his mind, he's got his eyes all the way over here, all right? So you've got to present this in a very positive fashion, all right? And that's what we're going to talk about next. So let me go back here. Okay. Uh, I'll give you one quick little, um, uh, it was a famous saying from one of my favorite people. And I, unfortunately, he's run into uh, a little bit of trouble here in the last couple of years. Um, he had this saying, he said, if you, if you give me a steak dinner on a trash can lid, I'm not going to like it. It's going to look horrible. I'm going to think it's horrible. I'm not going to want to eat it or even touch it or take a look at it. However, if you give me that same steak dinner served on fine china, fine silverware, or crystalware, cloth napkins, and a nice table, okay, with a nice padded chair, I'm going to love that meal. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to think that's one of the best meals I've ever had. What I'm getting at here is you need to think in ter those terms when you're selling a contract. If you just have a written up contract and you send that electronically to a prospective purchaser, they may look at it and think, well, I don't, I don't know if I want this or not. You know? So you've got to package this thing up is what I'm getting at. You've got to package this thing up, present it in a neat, clean, orderly way that basically sells the sizzle, not the steak. Okay? So assuming at this point you've got your database of buyers, you've filled the order, so you know you've got a hand, you know, at least one person who wants to buy a property, the same kind of property that you have under contract. All right? um, in order for you to profit, you've got to sell the property, you've got to sell the contract, so if the buyer feels like he's going to go do a good deal, the seller feels like he's going to go a deal, and you're able to make a um, tidy profit in the form of a wholesale field. All right? So if you hadn't guessed, it was Bill Cosby that had that famous saying. Um, I'm not advocating Bill Cosby right now because of what he's um, uh, in trouble for. I don't know what the situation is, guys. I don't watch television. I lost track of it, quite honestly, with you. Uh, with I don't. I'm not. You know. I'm. I'm. When I wrote this, this was before he was in trouble, obviously. So, any case, uh, that's the example of how you, when you present something to me, it better look nice and pretty, or I'm probably not going to like it. So when you're when you're presenting a contract to a buyer, all right. Let's say it's this hundred thousand dollar property, and you're trying to get one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for it. All right, it may well be worth it, but if you can't convey that message to your prospective buyer or buyers um, successfully, it's just not going to matter. It doesn't matter if it's worth it or not. If you've got to, you've got to create the impression in their mind that it is it's worth it. So here's how you do it: you should create a package, okay, just almost like the book. The booklet that we create is one of our marketing campaigns. Remember the booklet we put together? You should be putting together a booklet that basically builds a case around the sales agreement. So in the booklet, you're not only going to have um, the, the high-level details of the contract, not the whole sales agreement, just the basic bullet items, what rights you have elected, what uh, rights they're going to inherit or they're going to get it assigned to them, um, just the basics, okay? Uh, Obviously, you want to have a price in there, the price that you want to sell the, sell the, have the, have the buyer pay, okay, which includes the price of the property and the wholesale fee, all right. You want to have uh, pictures of the property. I suggest an entire portfolio of pictures, inside, outside, all the basic systems. What you want to do, though, by the way, guys, is this: think about a person driving down the street and driving up to the property that that is looking to be sold. You want to put your photos in the same order that someone would see when they're going to a property live. So the first picture is the property of the house from the street view, curb, curb view is what we call it. 
Okay, then you can give one shot in each direction down the street. That's three pictures right there. Okay, then you want a couple close-ups of different exterior angles showing the yard, the landscaping, the roofing, the windows, the shotting, the front porch, the back deck, all that. Okay, then you go on the inside. The first thing you show, by the way, this is where a lot of people miss. And please write this down because this is important. When you open up the door, the front door, take a picture of the view looking through the front door into the house. Okay, remember this person's not there initially. They're looking at photos. So, so if you just go jump from the outside up to the kitchen, they're going to wonder in their mind there's going to be what's called a missing a gap. Okay, what's gap? Well, what does the front foyer look like? How did I get to the kitchen? So you need to take pictures almost as if you're a person walking through the house. And actually you should do it that way. Walk through the house and take pictures as you go through. Starting on the outside, transitioning to the inside. So you can take the picture going, th looking through the front door. Typically, you're going to turn either right, left, or go straight ahead. Whichever is the your intuition takes you, that's the route you go. Could be taking a right and going into the living room. Then you go back into the dining room, take pictures there. Then you go into the kitchen, take pictures there. Then you go down the hallway, take a picture of the hallway so they get the the vision, the visual of them walking down the hallway. Go into the hall bathroom first, then the other bedrooms, hall bedrooms, and then go to the master suite. Take the master suite and the master bathroom picture, okay? Um, and if there's a downstairs, obviously, then you go downstairs. If there's an upstairs, you go upstairs. But take the pictures in the order that someone would uh, see in a way that makes sense or resonates with them actually walking through the property. Okay, very, very important. Uh, next thing is a written description. You definitely want to give a thorough description of uh, the current condition of the property, what has to be done to the property, should should any, uh, should any there be any deferred maintenance, um, what do they have to do with the property if they're going to flip it, for example. Um, and these are recommendations by you, not necessarily, you're not dictating what this person will do with the property, you're just su suggesting that for $15,000 um, they could get the place painted, recarpeted, uh, put in new countertops and door and drawer fronts and new flooring, okay? Um, and then they would have a $200,000 property for a total of 140. Remember, they're paying 125 for the property, put 15 into it, they got it for 140, and essentially it should be worth 200 when they're done. That's I'm just giving you an example. But give them a description of the property, what, re what repairs or remodeling you suggest be done to the property, okay? And if you have an inspection report, attach the inspection report to the property. In fact, you should attach any other information you have, any disclosures, like if the seller gave you a lead paint disclosure, um, radon disclosure, mold disclosure, attach all those in there. If you have a history of rentals, provide the uh, rent, uh, three years rental history on the property. Any information pertinent to the property, you want to include in this package that you're giving to your wholesaler, right? Um, so put all those things in there, and then uh, you want to build a booklet out of this. Now what you can do is send the booklet out in the mail to your key clients, the key people. And also you can put it out online. You can put it on Facebook in a link. You can put it on LinkedIn with a link. You can put it on Twitter with a link. You can also, and you should obviously, put it on your website. Okay. Um, and there's a whole section on marketing wholesale deals when the training program you'll see there's an entire uh, module just on marketing for wholesaling right marketing wholesale deals but in any case for you you're right now you're trying to build a solid case on why someone would buy this property essentially buy the contract from you and the more information you provide the, the, the more pictures you provide the, the clearer the description you provide the more chances are you're going to get some offers on your property right um, in any case, that's a, I just want to give you a high-level view that you, just because you get something under contract doesn't mean you're going to be able to sell it. And you can't just sell, send people emails saying, hey, I got this great property. Um, here's a picture of it. And here's what's <laughs> going to be. Right? You've got to really communicate thoroughly, thoroughly, accurately, and completely as you possibly can. So in any case, guys, that's what I had tonight um, for wholesaling. Uh, we'll talk about lease options another time and what happens. There's other things that happen, uh, can happen. Let's say you don't sell the contract. What do you do now? 
Uh, we'll cover that. Matter of fact, let's do that next week. Next week's webinar, by the way, is going to be uh, what night is that? Tuesday the sixth. Okay. Um, so we will finish up wholesaling uh, next week, and then the following week we got a special guest on the December the fourteenth. We've got a um, financial planner from the Vegas area and he's got a really neat program for realtors and real estate investors. Um, he's going to give you a bunch of stuff for free as well as his contact information. Because one of the things he's going to give you is something that you can use to give to your clients. Okay? Um, your, your real estate clients. It would be could be owner occupants, it could be investors. So you definitely want to be on that webinar which is the 14th. Next week we'll wrap up wholesaling. We'll talk about what do you do if you can't actually sell the contract. We'll give you some options there. So, in any case, for tonight, guys, let me bring my panel back over and make sure I'm all caught up on questions. It looks like I am. Again, I hope you all had a happy and blessed Thanksgiving with you and your families. Um, I thank you for being on tonight. I know a lot of you are just getting back in the swing of things again. Uh, we got four weeks to go before Christmas. Um, I am taking off the entire week of Christmas. No webinar that week, but we do have webinars uh, this week and, of course, the next three weeks. So in any case, let me know if there's any other subjects you want to talk about. The, the By the way, after the 14th, the next one is going to be on Tuesday the 20th. So if you have any subject you want to discuss then, let me know. Now, when we come back from the holidays, we're going to kind of gotta start back at the beginning, start going through the material from the very beginning. That'll take us all the way through uh, summertime. So we did that last year and people seem to really like that. Um, all of those webinars, by the way, are being transcribed. Uh, I was going to tell you that for Christmas bonus. I just slipped and gave you a Christmas present. So in any case, uh, early Christmas present. All the webinars we did in 2016, the first half of the year, not all of them, but, but most of them, we're having transcribed. So what that means is all the marketing campaigns are not only going to have the audio-visual explanation of them with examples, but you're going to have the written, the written uh, version of that to go with it uh, for free. All those, I mean, I think there's probably 20 or 20 to 30 of them. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be sometime, um, well, I don't know when the when transcriber is going to have that, probably in January, but I wanted to announce that to you for Christmas to give you, um, uh, give you something to look forward to. So it's a great way to build your, your book of information. You should have a pretty big manual going on by now for those of you who have been in for the last year. Your manual should be pretty thick. So in any case, you guys have a wonderful week um, and a great weekend coming up here. Uh, I will be in Alabama next week. I mean, by the way, I'm in St. Pete this week for my own training, Alabama next week, and back in Atlanta the two weeks prior to Christmas. So in Atlanta, for those of you from Atlanta, keep an eye on the air out. Uh, Lev Mills and I are working on setting up the Atlanta region, Southeast region mastermind. A lot of you are ready for that, so it looks like the 20, let me go back here. Um, well, I'm not sure when that's going to be now. It might be the 20th, uh, but in any case, what we're looking for is we're going to set up a mastermind for you guys, and uh, anybody in the Atlanta area, in Georgia essentially, is going to be invited initially. And from there, we'll get it down to the core group for the for that uh, mastermind, and we're gonna we're gonna assign a group leader for your region, and you're gonna be off and running with that. And it's an awesome, awesome way to take your business to the next level. It doesn't cost anything at this point. Um, we're trying to get you guys on board with that, doing it on your own. Um, we've done it before for other regions. It does work well. Uh, sometimes we got to step in and really help, but it costs money to do that. So we were trying to help you guys out here. In any case, just uh, food for thought. Keep that in mind. Um, in the meantime, have a wonderful night, an awesome week, and God bless everyone today. Thank you. Good night.